So I want to say thank you to Janet for bringing that reading to us this morning. So Genesis chapter 32. What if God loves you enough to wrestle with you because he wants to bring you to a place of fresh surrender so that he can bless you? So here's a question. Don't you just hate it when you have those sleepless nights, when you lie in bed for hours, tossing and turning, awake, unable to sleep, thinking, stewing, wrestling, worrying, struggling, trying to pray, trying to hand it all over to God? It might be over finances. It's often over family. It can be over health, waiting on doctor's results. It's often things at work that are getting to you getting you down, stressing you out. It can be something small, but it's often something that feels so big that it overwhelms you during the night. So what is it that keeps you awake at night? So here's Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, one of those most sleepless nights in his whole life. Verse 11 tells us that he is full of fear. Verse 7 says that he is stressed and de-stressed. And verse 24 says that he is alone in the darkness, unsure, uncertain what tomorrow is going to bring. And then out of nowhere, this man, inverted commas, verse 24, so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Or is it an angel or maybe even God himself in human form confronts him, attacks him, wrestles Jacob to the ground, struggles and battles with him the whole night long? And the question, what on earth is God doing in Jacob's life? The question, what is God doing in your life at this moment? What on earth is going on? And the truth is, God has been wrestling with Jacob his entire lifetime. God has been working and speaking and struggling with Jacob since he was a baby because God loves him. And God has a purpose for his life, purposes to give him and us life and joy and happiness and hope. But we hang on to our own little plans and designs, don't we, for life? We think if only we do things our way, do life our own way, follow our own dreams and our own schemes, get where we want to go in life and get what we want in life and out of life, then that's what is going to make us really happy. And folks, you will know and I know how wrong we are if we think like that. How wrong Jacob was too. This night at the ford of Jacobeth, verse 22, Jacob stood alone in the darkness, wrestling and struggling with God once again because God loved Jacob so much he wanted to bless him. And God loves you the way that you are, but he loves you far too much to leave you the way that you are. He takes you as you are, but he will not leave you as you are. And God's aim and God's goal and God's purposes in your life is to totally remake you, reshape you, remold your life into the very character likeness and the loveliness of his son Jesus. But he can only begin the work when you come to the point where we, you, I, are willing to give up our own little plans. Give up control of your life and yield to his ways and surrender completely to his lordship over your life. Again, Jacob's prayer in verse 11 is this, Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But it is God himself who attacks Jacob in the darkness of the night. Verse 24, so Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So God is the attacker. God is the one who initiates this all night wrestling match. God is the one who strikes first. You know, I am so, so thankful when I look back over my life that God in his sovereign grace and love was at work in my life way before I was ever conscious of him. That in his love he has pursued me, he has persisted with me, he has wrestled me away from my own plans and purposes to bring me into line with his. There have been many times when I have fought against him, fought to go my own way, 
get my own way because I thought my way was better than his way. But God's ways are always, always better, aren't they? God's purposes for your life are always better. God's plans for you and me always turn out better in the end. Jacob was a fighter all his life. He's always been a fighter. Even as a baby in his mother's womb, he fought with his twin brother Esau. Rebecca, his mom, had an awful pregnancy. The twin boys were constantly kicking and jostling and fighting inside her womb for supremacy. Again, you just look at Genesis 25 and verses 22 to 23, it says, But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? she asked. And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two rival nations. One nation will be stronger than the other. The descendants of the older son will serve the descendants of your younger son. Esau, as we know, was born first and Jacob delivered next, a few minutes later, grabbing onto his brother's heel, not letting go, verse 26. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So Jacob was a fighter and all his life he fought and he wrestled and he battled to get what he wanted to get and to go where he wanted to go in his life. And if anyone stood in his way, He was prepared to get the better of them through lies, deceit, and treachery. Even his own twin brother Esau, Genesis chapter 23, he got his own way. Even his own father Isaac in Genesis chapter 27, he gets his own way. Even with his uncle Lapin in Genesis chapter 30, he gets his own way. And you know the stories that even by lies and treachery and deceit, Jacob pulled the wool over their eyes, even over his own dying father's eyes. And effectively, he stole from his twin brother Esau two things. First, Esau's birthright. Again, Genesis chapter 25, verses 31 to 33, it says that Jacob replied, All right, but trade me your birthright for it. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? So Jacob insisted, well then swear to me right now that it is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling his rights, his birthright as the firstborn to his younger brother Jacob. And secondly, Esau's blessing that he was to receive from his dying father in Genesis 27, verses 35 to 36, where it says, But Isaac said, Your brother was here, and he tricked me. He carried away your blessing. Esau said bitterly, No wonder his name is Jacob, for he has deceived me twice, first taking my birthright, and now stealing my blessing. Oh, haven't you saved even one blessing for me? So no wonder Esau held a grudge and he actually swore to kill Jacob as soon as their poor father died and was buried. Again, we see that in Genesis 27 verse 41. Esau hated Jacob because he had stolen his blessing. And he said to himself, my father will soon be dead and gone. Then I will kill Jacob. So Jacob had to run for his life from his brother Esau. And that was 20 years previous. And now Jacob's coming back home, coming to face his brother's wrath. But before Jacob meets Esau face to face, God himself meets and encounters Jacob in the darkness of this night to wrestle with him once again, to speak to him in love once again, to bring Jacob to a place of fresh brokenness and dependency once again where instead of getting and grabbing and living life depending on himself and his own strength, God will disable Jacob by dislocating his hip. Genesis 32 verse 25. When the man saw that he couldn't win the match, he struck Jacob's hip and knocked it out of joint at the socket. So Jacob would be forced to hang on to God to support his own strength. Otherwise, Jacob could not stand. Jacob 
would not let God go because Jacob could not let go of God, verse 26. He needed God in a way that Jacob had never needed God in his life before. Never needed anybody in his life before. In a way that Jacob had never depended on God in his life before. Never had depended on anybody in his whole life before. That night, encountering God would change Jacob forever. And God gave Jacob a new name. No longer was he to be called Jacob. He grabs, he deceives. From now on, chapter 32, verse 28 tells us, your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. It is now Israel, because you have struggled with both God and men and have won. He is to be called Israel. God contends, fights. He is a changed man from this night on. He is a changed character from this night on. You know, folks, you know when a person is truly converted to Jesus, when Jesus breaks into a person's life and they are truly converted, they are forever changed. Something new happens. A new life begins. A new person is born. Those words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that says this, If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God. It's God's work from start to finish. When someone becomes a Christian, they become a brand new person inside. They are not the same anymore. A new life has begun. All these new things are from God who brought us back to himself through what Christ Jesus did. So Jacob will look back on this night in years to come with such affection. The night that he met with the living God. The night when in God's grace and God met with Jacob in the darkness, but lovingly drew him to a fresh and total surrender of his life. The night when God did a brand new thing in Jacob that led to a total change to Jacob. The night the old Jacob died and the new person Israel was born and birthed. So what about you? What about me? Do you need a fresh encounter with Jesus today? Do you need to yield and surrender afresh to God all that you are and all that you ever hope to be? I do. You do. We all do. The biggest danger in all our lives is that we live on past encounters with God, living off yesterday's scraps. We desperately need fresh encounters with God this morning. Our hearts need to be squeezed in his hands. I love that song of Robin Marx that says, Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be, all of my ambitions and hopes and plans, I surrender these into your hands. For it's only in your will that I am free. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. If only, if only you, if only me, if only we could make these words the total and wholehearted prayer of our lives. Sometimes we fear that if we give God what he wanted, we would somehow be the losers. I know that God is a good, good father who orchestrates all this. This is his great love, so that he could bless Jacob, not hurt him. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to the lies Satan whispers into your head and into your mind, that if you really were to give God what he wants from you, that we would be the losers and not the winners. Nothing, nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Again, I love those words in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Folks, I honestly believe that God's heart is to bless us today. Bless you. But you and I first need to take a fresh step of surrender, to submit, to yield everything over to him and to trust him with all. If you did that, I honestly believe that we would perhaps begin to see even the breaking out of revival in this land, 
in this church, in this city. Because it really begins with us doing that very thing, and that is surrender. It happened in Jacob's life when he came to that point of surrendering. He was given that new name. He was given a new future. And indeed, he fitted in with God's purposes for his life. That's exactly what God calls of you and I, that we indeed just come into line with all that he has for us. Let's do that as we seek to follow him with all our hearts. We're going to listen to a testimony. It's from a man called Francis Collins. It's one of the Alpha Testimonies. And Francis Collins indeed is a scientist and he had an encounter with the living Jesus and indeed how he surrendered his life. It's just four minutes long. Uh, Listen to this and that'll be followed by a song. 